uh, I've, sh I've shared with you uh, this before, but it's probably good, at least just for me, to remind myself of this on a, on a regular basis, uh, that I am not yet free from the presence of sin in my life. Probably the sin that is most characteristic in my life, a consistent temptation, you've heard me say, is binge watching TV. Uh, if I watch an episode of some show and then turn off my iPad, I'm fine. <laughs> I have enjoyed it and I can move on. But if I watch a second episode in a row, it takes a little bit more self-control, uh, a little bit more effort, but usually I can, I can put it down. If I start a third episode, I'm done for. <laughs> True story, I, I can't tell you a time where I watched three episodes of, of something, of anything on my own, and I had the ability to turn it off and walk away before like two or three in the morning when I was so completely exhausted that I just crashed. And then getting up the next day overly tired, I get home and it's not yet time for bed, but I don't have the energy for anything else. And so I, I put on my headphones and watch an episode, but now uh, I'm so tired, I don't have the strength to resist a second and the race is on. Maybe, I don't, it feels weird to you. Like to think about like watching a little too much TV as a sin. I, I mean, sure, like if the content is like excessively vulgar or violent or sexual, but like the Bible doesn't really have much to say about enjoying some entertainment. And besides, like binge watching TV is a pretty normal experience these days. Uh, sort of culturally, there's a, there's a sort of bragging about the shows that we are binge watching right now. So yeah, right, there's no verse in the Bible, no explicit law of God from the mountain that says thou shalt not binge watch. Uh, my, my binge watching of TV isn't a sin because I've broken some eternal commandment. My binge watching is a sin because it does what all sin does. It disconnects. It disconnects me from those that I was made to be in relationship with. It, it disconnects me from God. It disconnects me from my friends and my family. It disconnects me from myself and those that God has called me to serve. If this is the heart of sin, then it shouldn't be hard for us to start to name some, some other sins in our lives. And you know, maybe binge watching TV isn't your thing. Sh surely there is something that you feel drawn to. Something that, that calls to you, that tempts you. There's something that, that gains a sort of control over, over your mind, over your, your time, over your, your body, over your life. Is it an unhealthy connection to your phone? Uh, is it an overgrown desire to throw yourself into work? Is it an unhealthy focus on your family? Uh, is it an uncontrollable need to, to get more money or stuff? Is it an obsession with status or success? or an unrestrained desire for pleasure in any of its forms, for food, for entertainment, for sex? Do you have a need to stay busy? Do you recognize anything in this list? Does any of it resonate with you? If these are sins, it's not because they are inherently bad. Right, like a phone isn't good or bad. And we were made for work. 
God, God gave us our families. Money and stuff is, is part of just how we survive in this world, right? And so on. All of these things might have a place in a life lived for God, a life that is pleasing to God. But any one of them might also have a place in a life that is lived in opposition to God. Our passage this morning calls us calls this kind of life, a life lived in opposition to God, life according to the flesh. Romans 8, verse 5, reading in the ESV translation. Paul writes, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. In verse 6, To set the mind on the flesh is death. Verse 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's instructions. Indeed, it cannot. For Paul, our flesh isn't simply our bodies. Like Paul knows that our bodies were made good and for good by God. But he also knows that sin has corrupted our bodies. And so flesh is Paul's way of describing the, the disordered desires of the body. Life according to the flesh is life lived in obedience to our cravings. What I want, I do. What I want, I take. What I want, I enjoy. Now, if you can, try to keep all of this that we've just considered, uh, this life according to the flesh, um, in mind as we move forward. Because for the next few minutes, uh, we're going to follow a shift in Paul's thinking that might not be obvious. But For the first 17 chapters of verse 8, Paul, he's contrasting uh, the life according to the flesh with this other kind of life. But then in verse 18, he makes this really big transition. And it's, it's most obvious when you get into verse 19, because Paul picks up the language of creation. He starts to say things like, for the creation waits with eager longing. In verse 20, he says, for the creation was subjected to futility. And then in verse 22, he says, we know that the the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Verses 1 through 17 have been completely focused on the life that individuals are living you and me, in our bodies. But verse 18 shifts our attention to the cosmos, right? Sin doesn't just kill the sinner. Human sin has subjected God's good creation to futility. Verse 22 tells us the creation is in bondage to corruption. Bondage to corruption. It's kind of a big phrase. Creation, all that God has made, is enslaved to disorder. Uh, Creation, the thing that God has made is, is broken and it can't be set free. Creation is dying, and it can't escape, at least not on its own. Now for Paul, the link between these various themes he's talking about is obvious. Human rebellion, our sin, has broken and is still breaking God's creation. If humans are slaves to our flesh, to our cravings, to the disordered desires of our bodies, then how could creation possibly hope to get free 
from our sin and its impact. And yet, Paul tells us that creation eagerly longs for freedom. Right? Creation, it groans as it waits to be set free from this bondage. But creation isn't just this big and impersonal thing. Notice with me, verse 23, not only the creation, but, but we ourselves groan inwardly. And then in verse 26, we don't know what, uh, what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit of God intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Paul notices a profound connection between creation longing to be restored and some similar longing that like is taking place in us. Where does your groaning meet the groaning of creation? Where does your groaning meet the groaning of creation? In the same way that your temptations are probably different than my temptations and your sins are not necessarily my sins, so our groanings are probably different. And it, it's probably not that difficult for you to figure, uh, for you to sort of know or figure out the sorts of things that bring me to my knees in prayer. Uh, in, in 2005, after a series of suicides at Livermore High School, a group of local youth pastors felt desperate to do something about teenage depression in our community. The deep groaning that in some cases was a literal wailing rising from students and parents and teachers and admin to meet the deep groaning inside of our spirits. Right? There is a hopelessness that teenagers were experiencing that, that felt devastating to us. Their, their sense of just complete despair. The idea that these young students felt so alone and so isolated that they saw suicide as the only reasonable solution to their pain. Th this completely tore us apart. And so at that time, in that moment, our grief met the grief of our world. We developed a program that would allow us to show up in the lives of high school students, to let them know that they weren't alone, that they matter, and that help could be found. I, I still experience this groaning today. I, I feel it deep in me. I hear it in the world. Study after study shows, seems to show that, that at a, at a moment, at the moment when young women get onto Instagram, their levels of anxiety and depression skyrocket. The way that Instagram isolates young girls, makes them feel inadequate about themselves, creates a longing for affirmation, and, and generally crushes their spirit is, is devastating to me. And if you ask anybody in the mental health profession, they'll tell you that young women are really struggling right now. There is a groaning in our world. And at the same time, study after study seems to be showing that young men are feeling completely lost and without purpose. Fewer and fewer young men are going to college right now. Young men are leaving the workforce in high numbers. Young men are, are the primary source of violent crime and they are committing suicide at higher and higher rates. Even college students who seem to have everything going for them are being crushed by a spirit of meaninglessness in their lives. And so I wanna ask you again, like, where does your groaning, the groaning of the Holy Spirit in you meet the groaning of creation? This has been a place of meeting for me, but I wonder what it is for you. This meeting, the groaning of the Holy Spirit in you and the groaning of creation is the work of the Holy Spirit. 
This groaning in us and in the world is the thing that that holds our passage together this morning. So notice what Paul says about the Spirit in verse 14. He says this. He says, For all, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Then in verse 16, he says, The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay, great. We have the Holy Spirit children of God, but what does this mean? Why does this matter for creation? We read verse 19 in part earlier. Let's read the full sentence. Paul says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. And in verse 21, the creation itself will be set free. It will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Are, are, you, are you tracking with Paul's logic? Creation is enslaved to sinful humans living as slaves of our flesh. And so creation's only hope for freedom is a different kind of human. Humans living their lives not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. These new humans are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And so we're talking about humans loaded with some serious power here. This Spirit calls people to come and die to their flesh so that they can live a life following the Holy Spirit. And when humans do this, Creation is blessed. Creation is set free. Creation is repaired and it is redeemed. Creation is waiting eagerly for the children of God to show up because God has equipped us with his very own spirit and life to become repairers of the world. Creation, it's groaning, listening with a a bated breath for a groan to match it. Creation is desperately looking for the Holy Spirit's groans from us, drawing us into the world with the power of God to confront the world's deep pain with love and mercy. But the enemy is at work in our lives and in the world. We we feel it. The enemy doesn't want creation to be healed. The enemy doesn't want the children of God to experience life and love. And so the enemy does everything he can to distract us. We see it and experience it every day in deeply personal ways. Someone we love, who we know loves us, has a device in front of their face And you might even have a conversation. They might acknowledge you and even speak to you, but they can't really hear you. Now, the enemy doesn't need a device, right? It's just the newest and the easiest of tools. But from the beginning, the the enemy has been using our flesh against us, our, our cravings, our desires, our attention, our wants. If if we can only lock in on them and make them the ultimate thing, the thing worth living for, then he can lead us to disappear into them. Because if I can lock in on my iPad and disappear into a series of TV shows, then I'm going to disconnect from the groaning of the Holy Spirit within me. If I can lock in On my iPad, I will disengage from the groaning of creation rising up around me. Those groans, both within and without, will get quieter and more muffled. And and I'll live, not as a child of God, bringing hope and life, repair and freedom to creation. I'll live as a slave, living a, a small Locked away 
life in a little prison of my own making, serving my own immediate desires. What I want will be my master. And the kids, those kids whose groanings I have heard for many years, suffering through anxiety and depression, will continue to cry out because I'll never get around to showing up for them. Romans 8 is one of the most beautiful passages in the entire Bible. I love the way it starts with a glorious declaration that I think we would do well to proclaim daily, I don't know, maybe hourly. I ask, do you believe this in your core? 8 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Right? Uh, if I go on at this point in my life, living a sort of life of partial obedience to my flesh, giving myself over to binge watching TV shows, I'm not in danger of winding up in hell. I'm in danger of a wasted life. As verse 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In other words, I, I can miss out on the very thing that God made me to do, that Jesus saved me to do. And it's not just about me and what I might miss out on. Creation goes on suffering. Because of what Jesus has done, life is available to us now. We can obey our flesh. It's the easy thing to do. It, it's the thing that we've always done. The patterns of our lives, the pattern of this world. Or we can learn to listen to the Holy Spirit groaning within you. And let me just say, if you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you and drawing you, this is a great sign. It, this might feel like permission. It's not. But if you're not instinctively always 100% obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean you're not saved. It does mean that you might have had a lifetime of listening to, of trusting your flesh. And the Holy Spirit is calling you into a better way of life. Creation is waiting right now, eagerly longing for you. You, child of God, filled with God's Holy Spirit to show up. Will you? Jesus invites us right now to practice listening to the Holy Spirit. As he invites us to his table, as he says, do this in remembrance of me. And we do. Our team's going to come forward. And I just invite you, during this time, we're going to come and receive bread and cup and we'll return to our seats and we'll sing or you can just pray Whatever it looks like for you to listen to the Holy Spirit in you. Whatever it looks like for you to die again to your flesh. Knowing that you've been set free, you don't have to serve it. Jesus is inviting you. And so would you come today again in grace and mercy and love and compassion to the table of Jesus who gave his life for us, who said, not my will, but yours be done.